Alaska Insight is supported in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers just like you. Thank you. High rates of unemployment and billions lost in state productivity are some of the figures captured in a new report by the Institute of Social and Economic Research. ICER's document looks at the economic challenges Alaska faces in light of the coronavirus pandemic. What's at stake for Alaska and how much will state and federal spending help? We'll discuss it tonight on Alaska Insight. Good evening. Tonight, we're continuing our programming on the health and economic effects of the global pandemic. Joining us over video conference is John Bittner. John is the executive director of the Alaska Small Business Development Center. Hi, John. Thanks for being here. Hi, Lori. Thanks for having me. And also with us is Musin Gutabi. Musin is an associate professor of economics at the Alaska at the University of Alaska Anchorage's Institute of Social and Economic Research, or ICER. Musin, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Musin, I, I want to start with you. You recently comp completed this report looking at the effects of COVID-19 on Alaska's economy. It's grim. Uh, t talk a little about what your research found. And also, are you seeing a need to adjust the numbers now based on the continuing state mandates, business closures, schools shut down through spring? What's the picture? How is it evolving? Yeah, thank you, Lori. Uh, the, the report was an early assessment of the potential economic consequences of the, the mandates, the closures of restaurants, of, of establishments where people typically gather. And as you correctly point out, uh, the, the numbers are ugly. Uh, and this was before kind of these extensions that, that have been implemented over the last couple of days. Um, so initially I was showing that just from the closures and from some fairly simplistic assumptions, uh, we would see about 27 or 28,000 people be unemployed. And then if those closures last a little bit longer, there would be ripple effects that would cost another 20 or 21,000 jobs for a total of, of 50,000 jobs. Now, yesterday, Department of Labor uh, announced that over three weeks, we already have 36,000 people that have filed for unemployment insurance claims. So uh, to address your question directly, that means that we're very quickly approaching that 50,000 number that I was alluding to. And when I first stated it a week and a half or 10 days ago, people were really surprised at the ugliness of the number. Um, but now it looks like we may actually end up exceeding it. And were you projecting that that 50,000 mark wouldn't come until uh, the next quarter? Uh, so, so what I was basically saying is, is the direct effects from the layoffs in April would total about 27 or 28,000 jobs. And depending on how quickly uh, households back off from normal spending patterns, and how quickly businesses stop ordering from, from their suppliers, we would see that second wave, if you will, uh, in May and June. And now it looks like this is happening a little bit faster than even I anticipated. Mm -hmm. Musin, earlier this week uh, on Talk of Alaska, you said it's important to look at the situation not by the fiscal numbers, but by the number of months it takes for the economy to restart. Why is that distinction important? Yeah, because I, I, I think that the, the framing of this conversation is really important as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I, as I told you on Tuesday in Talk of Alaska, my initial concern about even doing the analysis was that people were going to interpret this as indicating that we should reopen the economy mm -hmm. today because people are hurting and we need to acknowledge that, right? And so that's problematic. Uh, but 
to me, the takeaway is that the fiscal actions at the federal and state levels need to be large and they need to get in people's pockets and businesses bank accounts really quickly because economies are not faucets you can't just order people tomorrow to start going out spending money sitting in restaurants and bars and businesses that are already hurting financially can't just pick up where they left off a month ago and so we need to be thinking about the fact that the tourism season is going to be much smaller than what we anticipated. The fishing season is going to be disrupted. And even when we contain the virus, which is really the most important thing, it's going to take a while for people to have the confidence necessary and the resources necessary to get back to par. And so we can't be focused on the next two months or the next month. We need to be doing at least planning of six or 12 months ahead because there are businesses that haven't even started losing employees that will miss out on a season uh, that basically gets them through a whole year. We haven't even started talking about local governments that are going to miss out on, by my estimations, some 200 or $250 million in revenue. In tax revenue, yes. Uh, that resource piece that you mentioned is so critical about how how much resource people will have to get the economy back moving quickly. John, that's where I want you to come in. What can you tell us about how the CARES Act funding is getting dispersed? There are numerous reports out this week that say businesses are not getting funds, they can't get answers, that banks are sort of closing ranks and responding only to their existing customers. Bank officials say there aren't clear guidance uh, guidelines from the federal government about qualifications. It doesn't sound like this is going well, John. What can you tell us ab about uh, what's happening currently? Sure. Well, I mean, on, on, on the first part of your question about the rollout, I mean, one of the things that you have to factor in and that people need to need to recognize, and I understand there's a lot of uh, concern and a lot of um, issues that businesses are having in the current situation the sba was given a monumental task they were never built to basically try and assist every small business in the nation at the same time uh, considering that the way they've pivoted to make that work uh, has gone as well as it has and i know there's been wrinkles but i i think that it's a pretty uh, amazing feat that they've accomplished to give you a feel for how much of the money has been distributed, in the first week of uh, the most recently re uh, released program, the Paycheck Protect Protection Program, uh, they've already distributed $115 billion. Now, the whole program is only funded at $345 billion or so through the CARES Act. So in one week, they've managed to distribute a third of their overall funding. Today, John, April 10th, is when self-employed and independent contractors can apply to the Paycheck Protection Program. But uh, what, are, what do you think this, uh, we, we already know there's a bottleneck here, and it's great that $115 billion has been dispersed, but we are hearing reports of this bottleneck that a lot of lenders are only working with existing customers. They don't, they're not taking in new customers. What kind of uh, concern are you hearing from especially these people who are self-employed or independent contractors who really don't probably have a lot of resource to hold them over until they can get assistance? I mean, there are definitely concerns. I mean, people are trying to find every way they can to help their businesses. Another opportunity to bridge the gap in the meantime is the economic uh, injury disaster loan. And if you apply for those, Depending on how many employees you have, you can receive up to ten thousand dollars in a uh, what they're calling a loan advance, but which is really a, a grant that you don't have to pay off and isn't dependent on you getting the actual loan. Um, and I know that's not a solution for everybody, especially folks with only one or two employees. It's going to be a much smaller amount, but it's still uh, some money in their in their bank accounts pretty quickly. Uh, the SBA has indicated that they're sending out the bulk of those payments over the next seven days, so they should be hitting bank accounts any day now. John, do you think that possibly it was a mistake for the money to be routed through banks and credit unions rather than a more uh, sort of a direct infusion from the federal government to business accounts, cutting out an uh, additional barrier to quickly getting funds? 
at least in this first round, Senator Murkowski said this week that Congress undershot in certain areas and they need to put more resources in. Should that be direct to businesses? I mean, it's it's easy for me to come in after the fact and, and try to, you know, back backseat quarterback what they did. The fact is they turned around one of the largest relief bills that the U.S. Congress has ever passed in record time with unanimous consent. Uh, I, I think that me coming in this late and trying to criticize how they did it is a little disingenuous. I think they did the best with the information they had at the time and the money is getting on the street and it's helping a lot of businesses uh, currently. Now, not everybody is being covered and that's, uh, that's unfortunate. It's, it's, not ideal, but with the time and the information they had, they tried to get the money to as many people as efficiently, but also as responsibly as possible. I mean, it is at the end of the day, taxpayer dollars. And so some level of oversight, some level of interaction between the businesses and financial institutions or the SBA was necessary. And the staff limitations meant that the private sector needed to join the poll as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Musin, oil prices dipped below $20 a barrel earlier this week, and ConocoPhillips announced it's shutting down new exploration on the North Slope. Alaska, of course, relies heavily on oil inter revenue. How will this additional piece complicate Alaska's fish fiscal situation? Yeah, it's, uh, it's coming at us from all sorts of directions. Um, Obviously, uh, the oil and gas industry is important, not just for the private economy, but uh, it, it still represents a non-negligible source of revenues for the state, even after the passage of Senate Bill 26, which allowed the, the state to uh, draw that 5.25% from the permanent fund. So Department of Revenue just released their spring forecast, um, and we were expecting about $1.4 billion uh, from, from uh, uh, oil revenues. Um, now we're expecting about $500 million less this year and about $700 million less next year. So we, were our, we had been discussing a fiscal gap for multiple years, uh, and now we're talking about an even bigger fiscal gap. This complicates the situation today because people like myself have been advocating or encouraging legislators to think about aggressive spending solutions. And in light of these future fiscal gaps, it makes investments in dealing with current economic calamity uh, uh, more difficult. Do you think, given this, this financial circumstance, uh, a report by Alaska Public Media reporter Nat Hers found that we would, and this was before the current further drop in oil prices, found that uh, we would still be in deficit next year even if there were no permanent fund dividend issued. Do you think the legislature should consider suspending the dividend for this next year or for a period of time until there's a little more stability? Yeah, good, good question. I, I think right now, any sort of austerity measure is really uh, gonna hurt the economy and it's not the right time for it. I completely understand the tension between the short term and the long run, long run sustainability of the fund and balancing the budget. But by almost every economist's estimation, Right now, what we need to do is be able to survive through basically this uh, pause in economic activity. And really the only source of spending is state government at the state level. Clearly the federal government's been as aggressive as possible uh, in kind of getting money in people's hands as John was explaining, but the state is gonna have to come in and try to help areas, individuals, businesses that are being left out of this process. And again, I, I, I'm, I'm cognizant of the tension between uh, let's make sure that the, the permanent fund doesn't lose uh, value and, and all of those arguments, but the state needs to be able to get uh, on solid footing economically uh, in the next six months or in the next year. 
and that's going to require spending money, whether in the form of dividends or grants or replacing local government revenues. There are a lot of ways of doing it. Thank you for that. John, you spoke a little bit about this earlier, but we've had a lot of questions from listeners about the distinctions between the economic injury and disaster loan and the payroll protection program. So help us better understand uh, each one of these programs, how, which one, uh, as you mentioned, there are loans, but they can turn into grants and flesh that out for us a little bit, please. Absolutely. Uh, the economic injury disaster loan is sort of SBDC's go-to loan whenever there's usually a natural disaster. It's deployed uh, in the past, it's been deployed on a regional basis, but as I'm sure you know, the disaster has been declared for all 50 states and uh, the entire U.S. at this point. So uh, if anyone that fits the criteria, and that includes small businesses, sole proprietors, uh, gig workers, and even some nonprofits, 501c3s, veterans organizations, and religious institutions, can uh, apply through the SBA for a federal government loan of up to $2 million. The private sector gets a 3.75% uh, loan rate, and the nonprofits get 2.75%. It's spread out over 30 years, and you don't have to start paying it back for about a year after you receive it. Uh, the Paycheck Protection Program is a new program that was created through the CARES Act, and uh, it's based off of your average payroll. Um, so one month average payroll, you can get up to 250% of that amount as a loan, up to $10 million. If you use it for payroll, rent, utilities, or other limited uh, qualifying expenses, all of those costs basically get forgiven from the loan up to 100% of the loan. So after you were on uh, Talk of Alaska with Musin earlier this week, I had a call uh, from, several calls from people seeking clarity about the programs. One individual says, said he didn't have a business license, he uh, hires people as he needs to, he, he runs a small landscaping business, and he said, mostly it's word of mouth that I get my work. I suspect that he is like a lot of people, especially in rural places where they are making it any way that they can by doing odd jobs and, and that sort of thing. And they may have a, a viable business, but don't make enough to pay federal income taxes. That was this gentleman's um, uh, personal situation. What, uh, I directed him to your office, but I wonder if there are programs in place or if there will be for individuals that are in these kind of settings. He sounded elderly and, and pretty stressed out and, and was looking for assistance. What would you say to someone in that particular working circumstance? Sure, I mean, first and foremost, and, and thank you for sending him our way, I mean, it's very important that everyone, if you think you're even remotely eligible, reach out to us, reach out to the SBA, and just make sure, because the, the rules and regulations regarding these programs are changing fairly rapidly because of the rapid nature in which they were deployed. Um, so if this is a problem that a lot of people are seeing, the SBA is really not trying to prevent people from getting this money. This is meant to get onto the street, but they have to do it responsibly, so there has to be some sort of check and balance. Beyond that, uh, there's also some individual level uh, benefits that were in the CARE Act, including unemployment benefits, the, uh, the individual payouts that people under a certain income uh, can get, things along those lines. And that, I know it's not going to cover business costs necessarily, but it will help him get through the short term until they can get the next round of relief funding, which they're already talking about on the street. Lucien, what are your thoughts about people in this kind of independent and financially sort of indivis in invisible work setting? How do you think uh, you were saying that now is not the time for austerity? What should the government do to help out individuals like this that don't have enough of a legal paperwork trail to establish their business setting? Yeah, no, I, I really think that's important. I mean, I did a calculation a couple of days ago. And, and people that are wage that, that are salaried or that have a W-2 and make less than $60,000 are really well taken care of if they get the stimulus check, the boosted federal uh, unemployment insurance and the state unemployment insurance. That money, that combined aid 
exceeds how much a person potentially was making if they if they earned less than sixty thousand dollars. Now you raise this really important question of of the people that are left behind or that are not included in some of these categories. And this is where potentially a direct cash transfer or a dividend could potentially help quite a bit, right? And so something that's unconditional, that's not dependent on work status, um, that could hit people's pockets really quickly. Now, that does not need to go to everybody, right? And so you can be surgical about it. You can only give it to people that earn less than a certain amount of money, or you can structure it uh, in a way where you, you work with the Alaska Department of Labor to identify uh, groups of people that are the neediest, for example. Uh, but that's why spending money and being creative about it and potentially getting money in people's pockets as quickly as possible is really important. And one last thing, this is why the state has a role in this process, because as John was saying, the federal government, in my estimation, has done a really remarkable job of getting money as quickly as possible, but they're not equipped, they don't have the information necessary to customize these programs for different states, for different localities. We have really seasonal industries. We have a lot of people that are self-employed. And the state has much more information and thankfully has a rainy day fund and it's pouring. And so it needs to be able to allocate some of this money for the neediest people. Given all those complexities, differing uh, financial levels, different needs, income needs, people that are sort of under the radar when it comes to tracking how they're doing their business. If it's now after the 1st of April, a lot of people may not have been able to pay their rent or their uh, utilities or mortgage on April 1st. If you were the COVID financial relief czar, what would you want to see enacted quickly to make sure that people can stay home and stay safe? I, I think I think a couple of things. One is obviously suspending uh, uh, payment, mortgage payments, rent payments, and some of this has already been done. Uh, meaning just ensuring that people are staying in their homes, that they're not getting utility shut off, and a lot of this has been done. The other thing is again, either giving money to businesses so that they can keep these people on the payrolls and that these people have jobs to go back to or get money to in, in these people's pockets as quickly as possible, right? And so the federal stimulus check is trying to do that. The federal boosted unemployment insurance, which will be $2,400 a month is doing that. Um, and then the state UI is gonna help, but anything to me that gets in the pockets of people and in the bank accounts of businesses, small businesses in particular, as quickly as possible is the right approach. Thank you. John, earlier this week, you mentioned that infrastructure bills are currently being discussed by Congress. What's the benefit of putting money into infrastructure at this time? No one can do the work during this time of social isolation, or is the idea more to just get the funding sort of staged and prepped so that uh, people can go back to work quickly on these needed projects when they can get back to work? What do you know about that? What can you help us understand yeah. about that? That's a great question. I, I think that, you know, infrastructure, much like the economy, isn't a faucet. I mean, it takes a while to get programs up and running, even if they are partway down the path. And I think that's probably where these funds are going to focus on is sort of what's called shovel ready projects. But even in that case, it takes some time to, to get everything sorted. So the sooner you can obligate the funds or at least make sure that there's funding there to support those projects, the sooner they can start moving forward and the sooner those jobs are created um, and depending on what infrastructure you support, it could also have a you know follow on effect for economic development and new business creation or existing business strengthening. I think that's kind of where they're at. And, and John, I wanted to ask about uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell announced yesterday, Thursday, that another 2.3 trillion will be made available to, for loans for small businesses. Um, is there, do you have, uh, are you hearing that they might find a, a different pathway to get these funds to small businesses given, as we've been talking about earlier, that these are extraordinary circumstances, there is a bottleneck. What's the answer for getting this money deployed quicker? Well, I, I think it's twofold. I mean, one is I've heard that they're talking about recapitalizing the existing funds, the PPP and the EIDL, which I think is crucial. There's a ton of 
applications that have come into both of those programs and if people have gone through that effort to try and get access to this money and then all of a sudden they shift to an entirely different program, I think that actually is gonna cause more problems than it fixes. Um, but again, that's only a portion of what you're talking about if it's a $2.2 trillion uh, uh, fund. And so I think with the remaining dollars, they can take lessons learned from the rollout of the CARES Act and model it to the issues that they identified. I mean, you've mentioned it yourself, the early stage businesses, the smaller businesses, the 1099, the industries that require that rely on 1099 workers. I mean, there's all sorts of uh, sort of niche or smaller um, uh, sectors that may not have been as covered as well as they should have been under CARES, and they can take care of that here. All right, thank you uh, both Lucine and John for being with us this evening. Thousands of Alaskans are newly unemployed as businesses abruptly shut their doors to respond to the coronavirus pandemic. That's only deepened a years-long fiscal crisis in the state. Alaska has survived rough times in the past, natural disasters or low oil prices, but these events pale in comparison to the global public health crisis we are currently fighting. The economic freeze resulting from efforts to stop the spread of the coronavirus have left many families and businesses desperate for assistance. Government support is crucial, and state and federal officials should not hold back dollars right now. Austerity will result in containment failure. We need leaders to be bold and speedy in deploying funds to help people access the financial resources they need to be able to stay home, stay healthy, keep their families fed and their lights and water on. It's our best chance to flatten the curve and stop the virus's deadly trajectory and the best way to quickly get healthy people back to work when the pandemic is over. That's it for this edition of Alaska Insight. We'll be back next Friday right after Washington week. You can find past episodes of the show and related content at our website, alaskapublic.org slash alaskainsight. Thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Lori Townsend. Good night.